so today, this is going to be two things. It's going to be a presentation that I hope to keep to 20 minutes. I'm going to try to make it 15. Um, it's, um, it's a work in progress still, but I'm going, to, I'm going to get through it as quickly as I can, but at the same time convey the information. So it's a kind of a 30,000 foot view look at the climate crisis. Um, and we're going to end, we're going to start with why we need to change and we're going to end in a positive place. So hang in there, okay? <laughs> um, so we're going to do that and then I'll leave a little time for questions or discussion and then we're going to transition into a storytelling workshop. And we're going to be talking about how to articulate and own your climate story and to leave here today and take the beginnings of that story and be able to put it to work. Um, in small ways, uh, or, or what feel like small ways, maybe, maybe a conversation, which is actually a really important thing that everyone needs to be doing right now, or having conversations, to gr bigger actions. Um, but before I get started, I just want to acknowledge and say that um, there are a lot of big feelings around the climate crisis and climate change as a topic, and I really want this to be a compassionate space. Not everybody has all the information, not everyone might agree, but we're all here to like, allow space for wherever a person may be at with a topic um, and to, just to give them space and compassion um, and for ourselves too. I have to say that for myself before I start giving the presentation. <laughs> so here's why we're here. Um, Earthrise is what this image is called. And it's the first picture of the Earth fully illuminated that any of us, any human ever saw. It was taken on the last of the Apollo missions in 1972. Beautiful. And it changed the way humans think about our common home. And it reminds us that we're all connected and that our actions have an impact on our world. So sometimes talking about the climate crisis is super overwhelming, but really there are only three questions that remain. Must we change? Can we change and will we change? First, we're going to talk about must we change. So the scientific community has been telling us that we must change for a really long time. And now, increasingly, nature is telling us. Here's another beautiful image of our planet. Um, this was taken from the International Space Station. It's an image of the sun coming over the Earth. And it's illuminating, the sun is illuminating the lower sections of our atmosphere, the tr troposphere and the stratosphere. And what it tells us is that our sky is not actually vast and limitless, like when we stand on the ground and look up at it. It is actually this very thin shell of protection for light. Unfortunately, into this thin shell right now, we are dumping 110 million tons of man-made global warming pollution every 24 hours. Um, that pollution, especially the carbon dioxide, is building up and it's trapping heat. And here's how that works. So energy comes to Earth in the form of light. Some of it hits the Earth and is absorbed. Some of it is radiated back out towards space in the form of heat. Some of it continues on through our atmosphere back into space and some of it is trapped by that thin shell, by our atmosphere. But because we've been dumping these pollutants into our atmosphere, we are thickening that thin band around the Earth. It's becoming more, instead of like a sheet, more like a comforter. So more heat is getting trapped. And, this is, and as a result, our planet is warming at an unprecedented rate. I think this is a really good visual. There are many sources of man-made global warming pollution. Um, but the main source and cause of the temperature increases um, is the burning of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels still account for 80% um, of our energy needs. Um, their uses and emissions have gone up since World War II. In fact, exploded. You can see we're increasing slightly and then bam, this huge increase. So as a result, global temperatures have gone up. Let's look at a visualization of temperature changes. So 16 of the hottest year, 16 of the 17 hottest years on records have occurred since 2000. But I have a really great visualization that kind of, I don't know, I think shows it more effectively than a graph. Um, so what these little tiny words are up here are all the countries on the planet. And what this visualization is going to show, it's going to show temperature anomalies from 1880 to 2017. 
The dark blue are really cold anomalies, negative two degrees Celsius out of normal, and then the red ones are hot temperature anomalies. So let's just see what happens or what's happened. Yeah, I showed this to a group of middle schoolers um, before doing a storytelling workshop, and one of the kids out loud gasped and said, oh my gosh, it's boiling. <laughs> I was just like, oh honey, <laughs> just really caught my heart. Sorry, microphone. Um, <laughs> all right, so heat's a problem. Heat's a problem for people. It's a problem for plants. Um, well, it can be a problem for plants. It's a problem for animals, crops, um, weather. And in Montana, this is um, warming win winter temperatures from 1895 to 2017. Um, and I'm going to use this as an image for these talking points. In Montana, our annual average temperatures have increased across the state since 1950, um, but they've increased two to three degrees Fahrenheit. And our state level changes are actually higher than what's happening globally and what's projected to happen. Um, we're a hot spot in Montana, and the High Line, in particular, northern Montana, North Dakota, northern Minnesota, um, is actually um, the most extreme hot spot. Um, and Montana is projected to continue to warm, like everywhere, um, into the future, despite whatever emission scenario we're looking at, even zero. We'll continue to warm for some time. But emissions really matter. By mid-century, Montana's temperatures are projected, depending on emissions, to increase mid-centuries on the left, either 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit to, or 6 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? By the end of the century, we're projected to heat up, depending on the emission scenario, 5.6 degrees Fahrenheit to almost 10 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> Globally, a lot of the extra heat in our Earth system is going into oceans. About 90% of the extra heat is going into our oceans, or has gone into our oceans. Um, the heat makes ocean-based storms like hurricanes more, it makes them stronger, last longer. It also causes them to stall. This year, Hurricane Dorian stalled over the Bahamas for 24 hours. Category 5 hurricane, and basically reduced community houses, infrastructure to absolute matchsticks. Um, the heat disrupts our water cycle. I don't know why I have to press that twice. Maybe I need to use the space bar. <laughs> it disrupts our water cycle. So more water is coming out of the oceans, moving over land, and then coming down in bigger precipitation events. Um, when the land can't absorb all that water, we have floods and mudslides. This, is, this next slide is amazing. Anyone know where that is? Huh? It's right outside Glasgow, Montana. And it's a supercell storm with a huge column of water coming down on these fields. Um, so extreme participation events have been increasing also along with heat since the 1950s. Um, and this is causing record flooding worldwide. In Montana, we're also seeing record flooding because of warmer spring temperatures and early and stronger runoff. This is the Milk River overflowing its banks outside of Chinook in 2018. Sometimes people wonder how climate change can be blamed for more precipitation and also more droughts. But essentially, the increased heat is pulling water out of both, right? Out of the oceans and out of the land. Um, and in Montana, droughts are a natural feature of our climate. We've had droughts. Farmers have dealt with droughts. But climate change is exacerbating how droughts work in our state and will continue to do so. Um, so this image shows sort of drought conditions from May 2017 through January 2018. And despite having a pretty normal, what looks like a normal spring on this um, graph, by September 12, 2017, we experienced 
Um, we had come through a very hot summer. We'll talk about the wildfires from 2017. But we experienced a very intense flash drought in August and into September. And it, it was a drought that happened quickly, intensified rapidly. And by September 12th, more than half the state was in an, a, a very extreme drought conditions. I'm sure you all remember. And by January, we hadn't recovered fully, right, with precipitation. So it's pretty amazing. Here's what a wheat field in eastern Montana looks like during a flash drought. <laughs> Not very healthy. So hotter years typically have more floods and droughts, and they also have more fires. Um, this graph shows how increased spring and early summer temperatures result in more wildfires. And in 2017, we had a heck of a wildfire season. Um, we set records in some areas for prolonged dry and hot weather. Um, resources were stretched thin. The cost of fire suppression this year were $400 million, 62 million of which came out of our state budget, state dollars. And when I look at the, when I think about these stats about 2017, and I look at the data on our warming potential for the next, you know, 30 years, I say, whoa. <laughs> I mean, given, I mean, in the West, our fire season is currently 100 days longer than it was in the 1970s. So what's it going to look like? We've warmed two to three degrees. So what's it going to look like if by mid-century we warm to six, and by the end of the century we warm to nearly 10? The US Forest Service has thought about this, maybe not that far in, it, in the future. Um, but they've really been dinged because of wildland firefighting has just, is just consuming their budget. Um, in 1995, they used 16% of their budget for wildland firefighting. 2015, 52%. 2025, they project 67% of their budget will be for firefighting. Worldwide, climate-related disasters are increasing in every respect. And this is being tracked, actually, by the insurance industry. That's where this data comes from. <laughs> They're watching it because in 2016, worldwide, climate-related weather events, or kind of um, extreme weather events, cost over $175 billion, US dollars, worldwide. It's very expensive. The extra heat, as you know, is melting glaciers. Here's Grinnell Glacier, 1910, 2017. In Greenland, this glacier was almost all the way melted by 2013 because of rising temperatures. And of course, scientists are tracking Greenland's melting ice and also Antarctica, and the melting ice in these areas are causing sea levels to rise. Um, there's a lot of different slides on this. Here's a quick one, just looking at the top 10 cities at risk for sea level rise by population. Um, most of these cities, except for Miami, are in developing countries. So if parts of these cities become uninhabitable, where will the people who live there go? Well, the Department of Defense has been thinking about that for a long time. And they've argued for quite a while that climate change and the climate crisis is going to lead to conflicts over refugees, food shortages, water shortages, among other issues. Heat is also stressing our crops. Um, crop yields for corn, for soy, for rice are beginning to decline because of heat stress. Exposure to high levels of carbon dioxide is actually decreasing nutrient content in wheat and soy and rice. For people, heat and climate, the climate crisis is a medical emergency. Infectious diseases, heat stress, air pollution from, fire, from fires, and waterborne diseases are all influenced by a changing climate, and they are definitely not in our favor. Tropical diseases are on the move. As it warms poleward, diseases have a bigger range to, to move and more people to infect. Um, along with habitat loss we are, and, and climate change combined, we are facing the, we are in the midst of the greatest extinction event since the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. So in Montana, <laughs> The climate crisis is going to impact every aspect of our lives. Water, forests, agriculture, recreation, tourism, our economy, our infrastructure, human health, and our community resilience. There'll be stresses in every area. So all of these threats globally 
help answer the question, must we change? Yes. <laughs> I think the answer is yes. And I like that slide. And I like to move through to can we change? This is really exciting for me because, I mean, when even my bad days, I'm like, we have all the solutions we need. Maybe not every single like, detail worked out, but we have all of it there to get started and solve this problem. And that is really exciting. Um, we're a smart species. We can save this. Let's look at, we're going to focus on renewable energy. There are a lot of other solutions. Um, so it was predicted that we would, um, in terms of wind energy, that we would reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. By 2016, that was exceeded 16 times globally. We see an exponential curve in the amount of wind energy being installed worldwide. And in Montana, wind en energy potential is really impressive. Um, Montana is ranked in the top five states for wind energy. Um, a Montana fact sheet was, rep was prepared out of the 2015 Wind Vision Report, and it basically said that technically, by 2020, Montana could provide up to no almost 90% of its energy needs from wind energy, and by 2030, it could be upwards of over 400%. Now, that's technical possibility. There are ecological cost and transmission issues that get in the way of realizing that full potential, but even if we just, like, did part of it, 30%, 35%. I mean, we, we have a huge resource in the state to help solve our energy needs. Um, globally, wind production could supply worldwide electricity consumption 40 times over. Again, I believe this is technical possibility. Solar energy is even more dramatic. In the early 2000s, the prediction was that we would install one gigawatt by 2010. By 2010, we exceeded that by 17 times, and 2016 by 75 times. So even with not like this massive system-wide support everywhere, we've achieved quite a bit because the market is driving it. Um, solar costs are coming down. Um, just like other technologies, like phones and computer chips, the cost is getting driven down as people are adopting these technologies. In countries where there's no grid, People are leapfrogging over old technologies and just putting solars on their grass huts. I have a slide of that that I left out just to shorten things, but it's pretty amazing. And in the US, there are even power companies who are leading the way. Hard to believe being a Mont well, Montana has some good co-ops, but <laughs> I deal with Northwestern all the time. Oop, missed one. Yeah, right? <laughs> so in March 2019, Florida Power and Light made this amazing announcement that they were phasing out two natural gas plants and replacing it with a 409 megawatt, 900 battery hour um, solar installation. Currently, the biggest solar installation on the planet is in Australia. It was built by Tesla at a wind farm, and it, it's rated for 100 megawatts. So they, Florida Power and Light is planning to complete this in 2021. Um, so they are leading, and it's very inspiring to me. In Montana, um, we're rated sort of 20, uh, Montana's solar resource is 26% greater than the national average. So I'm from Missoula, so we're socked in all the time with clouds. And I, when my husband was like, we should do solar, I was like, oh, would it work for like three months? You know, and he's like, no, we're going to have this amazing capacity. So this actually is our home installation that we just completed in August um, in the rush to get in before Northwestern changes the um, rates for solar, provide, solar users. Um, and Montana receives the same amount of sunshine as Germany, and they're the leader in solar energy in the world. Thanks to low land area, or, or, I'm sorry, thanks to large land area, low population, we have great capacity for rural utility scale solar in Montana. And there are a lot, as I understand it, there are many companies who want to come in and develop that. There are some roadblocks, which we can discuss in another context. Um, <clears throat> but we have the capacity, as I understand it, to develop 4,000 gigawatts of, of rural utility scale solar, which would translate to like 8,000 terawatts or something like that. In 2015, electricity sales in Montana were 14 terawatts. All right, so we have the capacity to solve this problem. And globally, every hour, 
Every hour, the Earth gets as much ener energy from the sun as we need to run the world's energy needs for a full year. Right? We just need to improve how we capture it, how we store it. But we're working on that. Storage is a key part of the solution. And the storage market is growing. And as the costs come down and the technologies improve, um, the, mar the market will just continue to skyrocket. And as the system starts to support it, we hope, 2020, um, it will grow. LED lights are part of the solution. They're growing. They help customers save money and reduce their emissions um, by reducing the amount of electricity they use. These companies are all either have an electric vehicle or are working on implementing electric vehicles in their fleet. Um, this is a big part of the revolution. So can we change? Yes, we can change. Will we change? Um, we will. We will change. You know, I have friends ask me all the time, like, so is it too late? I was like, it's never too late because regardless of how we do it, we're going to change. It will either be proactively on the front end or reactively on the other end. Change is coming to the whole planet. Um, and so it will probably be a mixture of both. It already is um, globally, but we'd like it to be more proactive than reactive, or at least I would. <laughs> so nations are, are working to need, nations are definitely working to need, unite. Um, it's sort of two steps forward and, two, and one step back, or three steps back, as in 2016. <laughs> um, but, I mean, almost every nation in the world signed Paris. We're even still signed on. We can't actually leave until, like, 2021. Um, so that's positive. Um, and we're seeing corporations, cities, counties, other entities actually step up and say, we're going to adhere to Paris, right? And we need that leadership at this time. We need everyone to be leading. Public opinion is changing. So Yale has this lovely scale um, that they call the Six Americas. And um, essentially, as of 2019, almost 60% per percent of Americans were either alarmed or concerned about the climate crisis. That's good news. Um, and the doubtful and dismissive batch has been decreasing. From 2013 to 2018, it went down. Both of those went down like six points. Um, so that's, that, these are positive signs. Um, our native communities continue to stand up to lead. They've been leading a long time. They've been talking about the um, ecological breakdown and the need to protect our earth for a long time. And now they're leading in lots of ways, but especially in the fight against, uh, or the fight to protect water in the wake of fossil fuel development. They're actually putting their bodies on the lines along with their allies and saying, no more, you can't come here. With some success and some challenges, of course, this is Winona LeDuc pro, um, protesting the latest uh, fossil fuel um, development in Minnesota, Enbridge is line three, which wants to take a new pipeline through the wild rice lakes of Minnesota. <laughs> so they're, having, they're definitely getting a lot of <clears throat> resistance, and I wish, I wish them all luck in that fight. And then last August, the youth of the world stepped up to lead. Greta Thunberg started in August 2018 all by herself outside of Swedish Parliament. And she sat there for a long time. After the IPCC report came out in October, I think the media started to pay attention. Um, and then in May, May like it was May 24th to be exact, 1.9 million students and their allies did the first global climate strike. And just a week ago, <laughs> two weeks ago, how many weeks has it been? I'm like lost count. Um, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Actually, I want to talk about, so we have the students stepping up to lead, and the other really exciting leaders that are emerging are these community-oriented direct action groups. Extinction Rebellion is a group in the UK. They're peaceful. Love is at their center. They use civil disobedience and family-oriented um, protests, which do not include civil disobedience, <laughs> to be clear, with the kids, to raise awareness and actually shut down um, city processes to bring attention to the climate crisis. Um, last April, they did an 11-day action in London. Um, they're very coordinated. They're very organized. They make sure that all the first responders, everybody who's responsible for public safety is in on the plan and that they have an alternate route to go, just to be clear when I'm talking about like direct action. Um, and 
After their 11-day action, after, in the wake of Greta Thunberg coming to the UK Parliament, and also David Attenborough relieving, releasing his documentary, um, the UK, a bipartisan parliament, declared an ecological and climate emergency. The first country in the world to declare it. So they've had a real impact on moving the conversation. Now what is going to come out of that and how they're going to implement changes is left to be, you know, remains to be seen. Um, but that's a real success. And then September 20th through the 27th was a big call to action from Greta Thunberg and other leaders in the world. And they said, we want the biggest global climate strike ever, and they got it. Between the 20th and the 27th, seven, over 7.6 million people took to the streets for climate. This is an image, as much of it as I could get on the screen, <laughs> of Montreal, where on the 27th, 500,000 people were in the streets for the planet. And I give, sorry, microphone. <laughs> um, and I give the clamp because what this reminds me, just to bring it full circle, is that we're all in this together. That none of us, what you're, when you're feeling isolated and alone and scared or nervous or worried or angry, that you just need to look at these pictures or call a friend or connect or come to one of these events. And we are all, in the, every single human and creature on this planet is in it together. And I hope you will use your choice, your voice, and your vote to support change. Speak truth to power like your world depends on it. Because it does. I get the clumps at that one too. <laughs> So I just want to pause and um, see if there are any questions about anything, and then we'll, we're going to transition into the storytelling. But I want to just give space to have responses or thoughts <laughs> or questions. Sir. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks.